he actually not fell in love with her. He forced himself onto her. It's a massive injustice done to her, failures all around to this poor lady who could never have deserved whatever happened to her. Probably one of the most gruesome murders that, that I've ever seen in, in my career. I answer my phone, she says, uh, Mr. Fente. He says, yeah, Andrea's dead. Yeah, we need you here now. Andrea has been murdered. I was shocked and I was devastated at that. Hi everyone, welcome to or welcome back to my channel and thank you very much for joining me here again today. Last week we spoke about the mob justice that took place in an area called Parkwood in Cape Town and how a young man named Abungile Mafalala was brutally and publicly murdered. I do know that there are updates to this case and we will go through it once and hopefully justice is served for Abungile's family. But today we're going to talk about another case, obviously. But this case was suggested to me, and thank you very much for everyone for their suggestions. But while reading through this case, firstly, sadly, there is still no conclusion as this case is still ongoing. And you may ask why, especially when you know the timeline for this case, but we'll get into that a bit later. But secondly, this case is just so ridiculous and so traumatizing for the families that are involved because of how long it's taking to conclude. But before continuing with this case, like I said, it is still ongoing, so all those involved in this case are presumed innocent until proven guilty in the court of law. And with all of that being said, let's get into today's case. Intended for mature audiences only. Today we are heading to the area of Rustenburg and we are going to talk about the case of Andrea Fenter. Andrea at the time was 25 years old and was working as an accountant in Rustenburg, for an accounting firm. Andrea's family described her as hardworking, driven, dedicated, and incredibly kind, and so soft-hearted. A couple years after working at the accounting firm, Andrea fell in love with a man named Gerard Janse van Vieren, and this was around 2005. Everything between Gerard and Andrea seemingly was going very well in the beginning, the couple was very happy, and they were getting along swimmingly, apparently, but sadly things started to take a very quick and horrible turn for Andrea and Gerard's relationship. Those quite close to Andrea said that she became incredibly reclusive, shy, cold towards her family and she really didn't spend any time, if any, talking to her family about anything regarding her and Gerard's relationship. Her dad said that she became incredibly timid and he was slowly watching Andrea become less and less of who she was before she met Gerard. So like we said with Andrea and Gerard's relationship, everything started off really well, but then things got really emotionally and then physically abusive. And when I say abusive, I mean really, really bad. And Gerard wasn't only hurting and threatening Andrea, apparently he was also turning towards Andrea's father named Dries. And Dries Fenter is Andrea's father. And this is what he had to say about the threats coming from Gerard. She turned completely. He never talked to us. She was always afraid of him because he said if he can't get her, no one gets her. And uh, if she doesn't comply with his pressure, she, he will get some Somalias to uh, come and kill me and my wife. But then in 2008, something snapped within Andrea and she had just had enough now. And she then filed a restraining order against Gerard. And she just couldn't handle the shouting, the screaming and the abuse that Gerard was putting on her, apparently. And one of the reasons that Andrea had finally snapped was because in 2008, when she filed this restraining order, Gerard had apparently just strangled and beat Andrea very, very badly. And with the restraining order, Gerard didn't comply with it at all. He kept coming to Andrea's home and he kept trying to talk to her and trying to reconcile with her. And like I said, Andrea, Gerard and her family lived in Rustenburg. And in order to get away from Gerard, Andrea left all the way to Johannesburg. She left everything behind, her work, her family, her loved ones, her friends and her familiarity. And she fled to Johannesburg. And just as a side note, the restraining order that Andrea opened was not the first court order assigned to Gerard Janse von Furen. Apparently, Dries, who is Andrea's father, 
also opened a restraining order or court order against Gerard. And the reason that he did this was because apparently one day when Gerard was driving Andrea home from work, they got into an altercation within the vehicle. And then Gerard apparently pushed Andrea out of the car. And then he threw her laptop on top of her. And Dries saw this entire altercation transpire. And he then went straight to the police and said that he wants this man nowhere near his daughter. But sadly, like many of these types of people who have their claws wrapped around their loved ones, they just know how to work and get their claws deeper into the people they love. And they know how to then bring them back into their grasp. But like I said, Andrea had had enough and she then fled to Johannesburg to now try and start a new life there. And Andrea tried to go to Johannesburg to try and see if maybe the dust would settle between her and Gerard to see if maybe he would just eventually forget about her and leave her alone. But in one statement that Dries said to the newspapers who would later go and talk to him, he said that Gerard never fell in love with Andrea, his daughter. Dries really believed that that Gerard forced himself onto her and that it was never really a mutual love. But Andrea is really strong and determined and she did manage to get an accounting job within Johannesburg. But Gerard is not letting up at all and he really tried his hardest to find Andrea within Johannesburg. And Joburg is a very big city so it's really like trying to find a needle in a haystack but he managed to somehow do it. And how Gerard managed to find one lady within a massive city, you may ask. Well, remember, Andrea worked as an accountant. And what Gerard did in order to find his ex-girlfriend was that he called every single accounting firm within Johannesburg until he found her. He found her around, taking a lot of calls in, into all the accounting firms in, in Johannesburg area. And getting to the 34th call, he, she answered the phone. She said, he said to her, now I found you, I will know where you work. And because Gerard now knew where Andrea worked, he then waited outside the offices until he saw her leave one day. And what Gerard then did was he then followed her all the way home. So now he knew where she worked and now he knew where she lived as well. And for me, it is really sad to see a couple who was really in love with each other for one of them to turn into such a monster. But... Before we get into it, let's just take a step back and let's talk about Gerard Janse van Furen. Gerard's mom, who was named Tia, she is a really strong advocate for his innocence and she describes Gerard's upbringing as well as all of his siblings and her relationship with her ex-husband as incredibly traumatic. Tia would say that Gerard's father and her ex-husband would physically, emotionally and sexually abuse all of them. And she would say that whenever she tried to leave her husband, that he would threaten to murder all of them in the house. And Tia really wanted to try and protect her children as best as she could. And she really believed that the threat coming from Gerard's father was real, that he would try and murder the entire family. And Tia describes her son to be very intelligent, well-spoken and kind. And she really believes that the person he became was because of what was done to him as a child. And throughout the trial, she would advocate for him constantly to be evaluated psychiatrically because she really believed that he was traumatized by his childhood and isn't mentally fit to stand trial. My child comes from serious gender-based violence. My children grew up in a very, very broken home and we were very abused emotionally, physically, sexually in any way. And I always wanted to divorce my husband, but he always told me if I leave him, he'll kill my children. So even after our divorce, I always tried to be there for the children's sake. This is the end product of gender-based violence. This, this that you see here, intelligent, he's well-spoken, he doesn't drink, he doesn't smoke, he doesn't take drugs, but he was this perfectionist. I'm so sorry for Dries. I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I cried for them. If I didn't leave, if I didn't flee for my life, I could have stayed with those children and the dad could have rather killed me. And I've cried for 10 years. I felt so guilty. Now, if we go back quickly to talk about the protection order that was first opened by Andrea, like we said, there was a protection order. And like we also said, Gerard never listened to it and he would always try and get into Andrea's house. 
And Andrea would always call the police and either they wouldn't come to her house or like one time they called up Gerard instead of calling Andrea to check that she was okay, they ended up calling Gerard to check if these allegations that Andrea was saying about him were really true and they wanted to know if he really was or wasn't harassing Andrea. So sadly the police not taking action or their very poor action towards Andrea's claims may have had a part in what transpired next. Then on the 2nd of May 2011, Gerard knew exactly where Andrea was and exactly what time she would come out of her home to get ready to go to work. And in full sight of the security guard, Gerard then snuck into the complex, apparently, and he waited for her to get out of the house. When Andrea then emerged, he then cornered her, allegedly, and beat her in the face with a knuckle buster, stabbed her 14 times, and then slit her throat. And Gerard knew exactly what he was doing was wrong because he tried to evade police twice. And the first time, just after slitting the throat of his ex-girlfriend, did he then try and evade police custody by trying to slit his own throat. The security guard saw what was happening and did come running, but the time that he got there it was too late. He then ended up calling the police and an ambulance and they arrived at the scene. They checked the pulse of Andrea and there was nothing and she was declared dead at the scene. They then checked Gerard's pulse and they did find one and he was then bunged into the back of the ambulance and sent off to the hospital where he then made a full recovery. So once Gerard was medically fit to stand trial after his self-inflicted wounds, 19 months would go on and he was still not facing trial. And remember, he was arrested basically the same day that the murder happened on the 2nd of May, 2011. And the trial that was supposed to take place kept on getting postponed. And Dries, remember, who is Andrea's father, he got a complete shock when he then found out that Gerard Janse van Furen, the man who allegedly murdered his daughter, was now out on bail and only for 15,000 rand. And he was granted bail on the 3rd of December, 2012. Postponement the next month, postponement the next month, postponement the next month. Every time it was just postponed, postponed, postponed. Got the newspaper and I got back and as I opened it, bail, 15,000 for murder. How did he get bail? We weren't in court. No one was there. Andrea's family did not have an opportunity to go into court to try and persuade the judge not to grant Gerard bail. The police also never let Dries or the family of Andrea know that Gerard was going to be released on bail. But now the trial was fully set for the 13th of May, 2013. And on this day, Dries and the Fenter family then headed to the Johannesburg High Court in order to wait for Gerard to appear at trial. However, while Gerard was on bail, he met two Brazilian criminals who were now in South Africa and who had just been released via a drug charge. And Gerard and his two Brazilian guys started talking and they really tried to convince Gerard to go to Brazil because apparently he would be able to hide within the Brazilians and never be caught by the South African or Brazilian police. So Gerard now took this new idea to his family to discuss him maybe leaving South Africa and heading to Brazil. And this is what Tia, his mom, had to say about this. He wanted to now get his passport. So I said to him, I'm really stupid, Nibuti. You know, people just take the things and they stamp them. Let that guy just take your photo and the papers and hand it in. Okay, I had the criminal mind. My son booked online. I said, don't fly from my top room. Somebody might recognize you. He says that took him through to Devon. And therefore, I could have been in jail for aiding and abetting. I went to the police station to give myself over. They didn't even want to talk to me. I knew, I knew, I knew. And I was more than prepared to face the consequences afterwards. Why so? Because I'm just a mother. I don't know why. It is like your child. You feel you can pick up your child and just take him away so that he can't be hurt by the world. And if I didn't know where he came from, if I didn't know the circumstances that made him what he shouldn't be because he's always this kind-hearted, beautiful person, I could have said he's a monster, but he is not. So three days before Harrod's trial was supposed to start, 
Kharat was then driven by his mom. Some articles say he was driven by his dad. However, he was taken to King Shaka International Airport in Durban and he used a false passport under the name of Daniel Joseph Mutong and Kharat then escaped and flew off to Brazil. And maybe karma was out for Kharat because once Kharat stepped foot in Brazil, he was then arrested for false documentation because they had one look at his passport and they were like, no, no, something isn't right. Why South African customs couldn't identify this is unknown, but Brazilian customs did. And apparently when the customs officers at the airport in Brazil saw Kharat's documentation, they then brought Kharat into an interrogation room to ask him what was happening with his passport. And apparently, this is all rumors, but while Kharat was in this interrogation room with the officers, he apparently bribed one of these customs officers. And the officer was like, this is not happening. And then he was taken straight to jail for false documentation and apparently bribing an officer. But the Brazilians were not going to send Gerard back right away. They wanted him to serve out his full term for the illegal criminal act that he had just done in Brazil. So 2013, Gerard now escaped to Brazil and he was there up until 2016 when Brazilian officers called up South African Interpol to let them know that Gerard was most likely going to be released on good behavior. But South African Interpol was like, no, you mustn't release him. He needs to serve out his full term and then you can extradite him back to South Africa. They told us, you know, they, they take notice of this, but don't worry. You know, they've got a good system. This will not happen. I'm telling you a month later, the worst happened. They in fact released him without sending him back to South Africa. So the error, unfortunately, essentially seems to lie in the hands of this judge that arrived at the prison one evening under very suspicious circumstances to, in to instruct him to be released. So now Gerard is a free man in Brazil. No extradition. He is hiding within the streets of Brazil. And now not only does he have the South African police looking for him, but also the Brazilian police. But Brazilian police would eventually find Gerard Dianza van Furen. And only in 2020, when he was then extradited back to South Africa in October of 2020. Eventually, their efforts paid off. And the brigadier phoned me, he says, I'm, I'm sending some pictures to you. It was a relief. And actually, all the, all the old winds is now opened again. So in October of 2020, Gerard Janssen von Furen then touched ground back in South Africa. And the entire family of Andrea Fenter really believed now that justice would hopefully be served. And Gerard's pre-trial hearing was supposed to take place on the 27th of November 2020. But because of this, from Tia, Gerard's mother, the case was postponed again. I'm standing in, yeah, for that one as well, yeah. So we have uh, from Fieden and uh, Luigi. Okay. He was seen by, by two doctors then. So, okay. And, he needs to go um, out again. Sorry, who are you? I'm his mother. Please, he needs to go out again. Why? Because he needs that. He needs what? Because he needs that very, very urgently. Is he, he on medic is he on medication? I don't have to answer your questions. I'm just telling you you need to go. No, you're not telling me anything. I know my child, and I know what happened to him, and I know that he needs to go. And you know that he needs to go to a private car. Uh, he's got a history that is not mentally well. <coughs> An independent uh, psychiatrist to evaluate him. So if it is, they can give him for the, the whole of this. The case was then postponed to January 2021 and we are still here waiting until now where the case looks like it will pick up again on the 27th of July 2022. And I do really hope that justice will be served for Andrea's family. But sadly, Andrea's mother has since passed away and she will never see justice for her daughter. 
But this case is so messy and so drawn out that I really do hope that no evidence had magically been lost or disappeared and that this trial really gets the full justice that it deserves. But we will have to wait and see what happens in this case. But let me know what you think below. But do you think that someone's past really is a precursor for who they will become and if they become a criminal? And I'm not talking about the average citizen because we really know that horrible things happen all the time to people. And people can be incredibly resilient, brave, and people face hardships every day, but they would never dream of doing what Gerard did. But there are a lot of criminals who do horrible things like Gerard and who have had a very bad childhood or bad past. So the question is, do you think that they are born bad or do circumstances make people that way? But let me know what you think down below. I hope that everyone has a great weekend further. Please stay safe out there and I'll see you again next week. Bye.